In Chapter 3, we'll cover strategies for improving efficiency and minimizing environmental impact for existing oil heat systems. At zero smoke, oil burners create 3.2 pounds of CO2 for every pound of oil burned. The only way for us to reduce our CO2 emissions is to help our customers burn less petroleum. When heating oil is burned, it creates nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, sulfur oxides or SOx, oxides of nitrogen or NOx, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbons, free hydrocarbons or smoke. And finally, particulate matter. Nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor have no direct, direct impact on the environment. However, using too much extra air in the combustion process hurts efficiency and increases the amount of oil burned. This increases emissions of other, the other components. Oil heat equipment manufacturers are making great strides to make burners, boilers, furnaces, and water heaters more efficient and cleaner burning. Oil dealers install this new equipment and maintain it to run as clean and efficiently as possible. The result is the average oil heated home in the United States uses over 500 gallons less oil a year than we did in the 1970s. This has dramatically reduced oil heat's impact on the environment. Let's look at the emissions that are a problem. The first is carbon dioxide emissions. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming. When oil burners are running properly, 10 to 13 percent of the combustion gases are CO2. The only way to reduce oil heat CO2 emissions is to help oil heat customers burn less petroleum by increasing efficiency. The less oil burned, the less carbon dioxide released into the air. The next emissions are sulfur oxide emissions. Research by the U.S. Department of Energy at Brookhaven National Lab, the Canadian CET, and others has shown a direct relationship between the sulfur content of home heating oil and the fouling deposits built up on heat transfer surfaces. As the percentage of sulfur in the fuel is reduced, the rate of the heat exchanger fouling drops, and the need for vacuuming cleaning, vacuum cleaning decreases. Research in Germany indicates that the use of ultra-low sulfur fuel improves efficiency by over 1 to 2 percent. Finally, hydrocarbon emissions, smoke, and soot. When properly adjusted, oil burners produce very little unburned hydrocarbons. Oil burners should be over 99.99 percent clean burning. However, older non-flame retention burners are not this clean, and an improperly adjusted new oil burner can also produce smoke. Burners must be adjusted for zero smoke, and if that is not possible, they should be replaced. There are many ways that we can maximize the efficiency of oil heat systems. The first is to adjust for minimum excess air with zero smoke. It's probably the most important thing that our technician does. We have to clean the heat exchanger surfaces. We should adjust the burner with the proper firing rate and use the correct nozzle. We should adjust draft and check the draft drop through the heat exchanger. We should seal up air leaks into the heat exchanger, change air filters, seal duct leaks, check radiation and air valves, adjust the limit control settings to the proper settings, encourage the use of setback thermostats, use isolated combustion whereby we bring outside combustion air to the burner, and of course if they, none of those things are possible, sell them a new burner, boiler, or furnace. While we're at it, we can also add hydronic zones. The more zones, the more efficient the hydronic system can be. And finally, we should line the chimney. The ultimate solution for improving oil heat's environmental impact is the use of biodiesel and low sulfur heating oil. It's definitely the combination of the two is the fuel of the future. The advantages of ultra-low sulfur fuel are much cleaner heat exchanger surfaces that allow better heat transfer and greater efficiency. This also results in reduced service costs through less frequent vacuum cleaning and of the heating equipment. It lowers air pollution emissions, including sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, and fine particulates. It also improves the fuel stability and, of course, dramatically lowers the environmental impact of the fuel.
BioHeat is a blend of heating oil, ASTM D396, and biodiesel, ASTM D6751. Biodiesel is a non-toxic, biodegradable, domestic, renewable fuel derived from natural vegetable and animal oils. <clears throat> Current feedstocks for the creation of biodiesel are soybeans, canola, sunflower, mustard, and rapeseed oils, as well as waste cooking oil and grease, and as well as trap grease, tallow, and animal fats such as fish oil. Since all these feedstocks are new carbon that is currently in the carbon cycle, they do not contribute to climate change. Only carbon that has been captured underground, locked up in petroleum for centuries, that is brought to the surface, burned and released into the air, increases the amount of carbon in the cycle and contributes to climate change. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency recently confirmed biodiesel as an advanced biofuel. This meets the demands for the EPA's renewable fuel standard. It enjoys the highest energy balance of any renewable fuel. For every unit of energy used to produce biodiesel, you get 5.54 per units of energy back. The vegetable oils and animal fats used for biodiesel feedstocks are not produced specifically for biodiesel. They are a minor, minor byproduct of food production, so they don't suffer the fuel to food stigma that ethanol does. <clears throat> this slide illustrates the carbon cycle. Thanks to photosynthesis, plants absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Animals and bioheat burners eat or burn the plants, reducing the CO2 back into the atmosphere. There is no net gain of CO2 and therefore no climate change. The problem with burning petroleum is that we are drawing CO2 that has been removed from the carbon cycle long ago and are putting it back into the atmosphere, increasing the greenhouse effect and changing the climate. This slide shows the biodiesel feedstocks that are most popular. Plant oils, currently the most popular being soybean oils and used cooking oils, that's used McDonald's fryer grease and animal fats. Um, we use both, we turn both of these into biodiesel. Biodiesel is manufactured to demanding standards specified by the American Society for Testing Materials, or ASTM. And ASTM D6751 describes biodiesel, and ASTM D396 describes a heating oil blend up from 5% biodiesel up to 20% biodiesel and petroleum and regular two oil. ASTM D36751 standards do not allow the use of raw vegetable oils and fats as biodiesel. They don't allow non-esterified oils, partially esterified oils, coal slurries, or blends with diesel or any other biomass-based diesel. Many of these have caused serious problems in diesel engines in the past testing or have not been scientifically tested at all and therefore not allowed to be blended with heating oil and named bioheat. Bioheat is almost indistinguishable from heating oil. As you can see from these two flames, the flame on the left is biodiesel blend and the flame on the right is plain two oil. You can see there's very little difference between the two. Bioheat is a blend of biodiesel and ultra low sulfur heating oil. Blends from 2 to 5% are referred to as bioheat. Blends from 5 to 20% diesel are referred to as bioheat plus, and blends beyond 20% biodiesel are referred to as bioheat super plus. The advantages of all these fuels are first a strong public appeal as a renewable fuel. They're a minor byproduct of food production, not food for fuel. They're sulfur free. They have very good lubricity, which will help with low sulfur fuels because sulfur was a lubricant. And when we removed it, we needed some other lubricant to keep the pumps and functioning properly. It's totally biodegradable. It's non-toxic. It reduces scale and soot, it reduces nitrogen oxide emissions, and increases fuel source diversity, which reduces the use of petroleum. 
So the two tricks for us to reduce the use of petroleum for our customers is number one, help them use less oil, and number two, convert them over to a bioheat blend. And the higher the blend, the less impact we have on greenhouse gases. This slide shows how dramatically increased blend levels for biodiesel reduce our environmental impact relative to natural gas. As you can see at the, at the far left of the graph, at 200% biodiesel will decrease our environmental impact relative to natural gas by about 8%. 20% will do it by about 18%. So you can see the higher our blend levels, the more environmentally friendly and uh, fuel we become. Now let's look at techniques we can use to increase the efficiency of our customers' heating, existing heating equipment. Installing and adjusting heating equipment for maximum safety, reliability, and efficiency is very important. Even the best equipment can waste fuel if it's not installed and adjusted properly. Older oil boilers and furnaces are less efficient than the newer ones. However, there are some steps covered in this chapter that can increase the older equipment's operating efficiencies. The regular preventive maintenance tune-ups are our best opportunity to assure our customers' heating equipment is operating as efficiently as it can. Typical savings for a tune-up done every other year are between 3 and 6 percent. When adjusted, adjusting the equipment, always follow manufacturer's recommendations for proper adjustments. When properly adjusted, oil burners produce very few unburned hydrocarbons. Oil burners should be over 99.9% .9 clean. However, older non-flame retention burners are not this clean, and an improperly adjusted new oil burner can also produce significant amounts of smoke. Burners must be adjusted to for zero smoke. If this, not, if this is not possible, they should be replaced. The reason is that soot and scale accumulations on the heat transfer surfaces are insulators and will prevent the heat exchanger from working efficiently and absorbing the heat from the combustion gases and putting it into the house. Brush and vacuum clean these surfaces and then determine the cause of the soot. Air leaks into the heat exchanger should be sealed. Locations for air leaks are the space between the burner air tube and the combustion chamber opening. The seam between the combustion chamber and the heat exchanger on furnaces and dry base boilers. The space between sections of the cast iron boilers, flange seals, loose fitting clean out and flame inspection doors. Sealing these air leaks with furnace cement will reduce off cycle airflow and heat loss. To test for air leaks into the heat exchanger, compare the excess air levels over the fire and at the breach. They should be the same. If there is more excess air at the breach than over the fire, there are heat exchanger leaks that should be sealed. A major concern are furnace heat exchanger leaks, that are holes in the heat exchanger. Uh, the danger is pressure difference from the fire side to the air side of the heat exchanger will cause spillage into the combustion of the combustion gases out of the draft hood or the draft regulator. To find out if you have this problem, Take an O2 or CO2 reading before the blower kicks on and afterward. If the O2 changes 1% or more, there's probably a leak. You'll also notice that the overfire draft will drop. And finally, you can use a smoke candle or throw coffee beans into the heat exchanger. And if you get a, the smoke in the house or the smell of fresh coffee, you know that you have a leak. Flue gas temperature is directly related to combustion efficiency. As the flue gas temperature rises, more heat goes up the chimney and the furnace, boiler, water heater captures less heat for the house. The lower the flue gas temperature, the higher the efficiency. Typical net flue gas temperatures for modern heating equipment should be between 350 and 450 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a good practice to be sure the net stack temperature at the breach is about 350 net to ensure that the flue gases at the top of the chimney are above 200 degrees. The pro that problem with two anything below 200 is this is the point where sulfuric acid starts to condense. In most installations, a 350 net stack at the breach should keep the, that con condensing from happening. 
as sulfur levels in the fuel are reduced, this is going to be of less and less concern. If the net flue gas temperature at the breach is above 450, too much heat is going up the chimney and efficiency will be lowered. Check for the following conditions and take corrective action as needed. It could be there's excess draft through the unit. If the draft set is set too high, excess amounts of air enter into the heating unit through the burner and the secondary air leaks. These leaks lower combustion temperature, which reduce the rate of heat transfer. Because there are more gases flowing through the heat exchanger, they must also flow more quickly, and the heat exchanger has less time to remove the useful heat. The result is an increase in the net stack temperature and lower efficiency. The trick is to adjust the draft regulator and seal up any secondary air leaks. Also an outdated heating unit. Obviously, older boilers and water heaters and furnaces are designed to operate with low static pressure burners, which cannot effectively transfer heat from the combustion gases to the water or air. The result is higher flue gas temperatures and reduced efficiency. Outdated equipment gives both low carbon dioxide readings and high flue gas temperatures. The effect on efficiency is devastating. Common fixes such as fire bricks in the heat exchanger, baffles, and turgulators in the heat exchanger will slow down the flow, flow, but replacing the old inefficient boiler furnace is really the better choice. Another strategy might be to lower the firing rate. If the unit is overfired, the heat exchanger does not have time to remove useful heat because there is too much heat being produced in a short time period. Overfiring causes the burner to short cycle, which causes many problems. A common cause of overfiring is that someone has increased pump pressure to get better atomization without reducing the nozzle size. Remember, you, whenever you increase pump pressure, you increase firing rates, so you have to downsize the nozzle. Excessive firing rates cause problems for boilers and furnaces. Firing rates that are higher than the heating requirement in the building increases off-cycle losses. Heat loss varies with the off-period time, and the larger the firing rate produces longer off-cycle times. The solution is to reduce the nozzle size, but not below manufacturer's recommendations and not below what is necessary to keep the net stack temperature above 350 net stack. Selecting the correct nozzle size is an important part of proper service procedures. When, with fixed head burners, it may be necessary to change the combustion head if you're reducing nozzle size. Two exceptions to reducing fire rates are steam boilers and units with tankless coils. In these two cases, the unit should be fired to the maximum rating. New units that are properly sized for the load should be fired to the manufacturer's recommendations. Since most older heating systems are oversized, reducing the fire rate improves the efficiency in three ways. First, the net stack temperature goes down because the smaller flame produces less gases, therefore the gases spend more time in the heat exchanger. This gives the heat exchanger a chance to pull more heat from the gases and put them into the house. Off-cycle heat losses are reduced because the burner run times increase, so it's, le it's off less often. Cycling losses are reduced. Overfired burners make heat faster than heating systems that can than the heating systems can absorb it. So the burner cycles on and off on the high limit. The burner never reaches steady state. This increases the deposits on the heat exchanger and reduces efficiency. An average oil burner only operates between 15 and 20 percent of the time during the heating season. Heat losses during the off cycle for older units can be significant. New properly sized boilers and furnaces will not benefit from reducing the firing rate because the off-cycle losses for these units is already low and presumably they've been sized properly. Perfect nozzle size is the lowest firing rate that will heat the building adequately on the coldest day of the year, producing enough domestic hot water and producing a clean smoke-free flame with high combustion efficiency and ensure net stack temperatures about 350 degrees. Warm air ducts. Ducts that distribute heated air to the house lose heat in two ways. First, the heat flows from the heated ducts walls to the colder surroundings okay, by radiation and conduction. Heated air also escapes from leaky supply duct joints and cold air is drawn into leaky return ducts. Both of these losses reduce the useful heat delivered to the house and increase fuel consumption. 
Warm air is lower in temperature than hot water, but duct surfaces are much larger. Large duct area and the air leaks contribute to relatively high distribution system losses for warm air systems. Additionally, many warm air ducts pass through unheated areas, such as attics and crawl spaces. Because of the cooler surroundings, heat loss into these areas is very large. Be sure to inspect all warm air ducts to determine if there are leaks that can be sealed. Properly sealed and insulated ducts can reduce cooling costs by up to 15% and heating costs by as much as 20%. The furnace fan or blower moves 1,200 CFMs cubic feet per minute of air. Return leaks in the furnace room can be a draft big problem because the blower is strong enough to backdraft the oil burner. Leaky ducts can cause problems with the burner and furnace, but they can also show, show, cause problems throughout the house. This slide shows the operation of a system with no air leaks. As you can see, both the flue for the furnace and the flue for the fireplace are working properly. If there are leaks in the supply ducts, as shown in this picture, um, the heating system will suck air out of the living space and pump it into the basement. The air pressure in the basement will increase and help push the combustion gases from the furnace up the flue. That's good. But the problem is the pressure drop in the living space will suck air down the chimney, causing the wood smoke from the fireplace to come into the home. This slide shows the opposite problem. The supply ducts are not leaking, but the return ducts are. The result is the air pressure in the living space increases and the air pressure in the basement decreases. Problem is that this causes the pressure drop to be strong enough that it sucks air down the oil burner flue, back drafting the burner and sucking the burner combustion gases into the basement. This slide is the tricky one. Both the supply and return ducts are leaking. They're leaking more or less equally, so performance is not impacted until something changes. And of course, when this changes, then smoke starts coming out either in the basement or in the fireplace. Okay. Problem is that this causes erratic and unpredictable for performance, which can cause callbacks. You'll be going back, back and forth to the house trying to catch it when it's doing something wrong. Testing for duct leaks. The ultimate tool for this is a duct blaster, which pressurizes the ducts. It's shown in this illustration. If you do not have one of these, you can find the most obvious leaks by running the blower with the supply registers closed. Of course, turn off the burner to do this, and then examine all the ducts for leaks and listen for whistles. You can, use, you can also use a chemical smoke puffer to find return leaks. Ducts in unheated spaces should be sealed and insulated. The top priority is ducts outside the thermal envelope, the attic and the crawl space. This slide shows the most common duct problems. First is leaky, torn, and disconnected ducts. Okay. The second is poorly sealed registers and grills. They should be sealed to the ducts so that they don't leak into the space underneath the floor. Leaks at the furnace and filter slot, and kinks in flexible ductwork that restricts airflow. Common problem is panned floor joists. What they did is they took a piece of sheet metal and put it across the bottom of the floor joists and then used the space between the floor joist and the floor as the return. The problem is these are very hard to seal and they're sucking on a common leak, the band joist and sill plate, as well as the wall coverings above that spot. Another common leak is the filter slot door. Be sure these are sealed with removable tape so that you can replace it again when you replace the filter. Ducts in unconditioned attic are especially bad for air conditioning because the attic is the hottest place in the house. If the ducts or an air handler are in the attic, it might make sense, rather than trying to seal up all the ducts in the air handler, to just bring the attic indoors. What you do is instead of making the attic outdoors, you foam the roof of the attic and treat the attic as it's part of the indoor space. 
Be sure to seal the largest leaks first, that is the disconnected ducts, the missing end caps, big holes. <laughs> seal areas of the highest pressure difference, connections near the air handler, the filter slot covers, plenums, plenum connections, blower doors. And of course, most important, return leaks in the combustion zone around the burner. And then go after all the accessible connections that are easy to get to. Seal register boots and connections to the floor, wall, or ceiling. The way to do this is with duct mastic or fiber mesh tape. Aluminum FSK tape is okay on joints you occasionally open. A quick test to see if there are problems with warm air systems is the heat rise test. Drill small holes in the supply duct where it exits the plenum and in the return close to the furnace. Insert a thermometer in each hole and observe the readings as the unit runs. The difference between the two is the heat rise. The heat rise should be within manufacturer's recommendations, generally between 45 and 70 degrees. If the rise is greater, check the air filters. Be sure the registers are unblocked. Okay, be sure the flan belt is not slipping. Now let's look at efficient water heating. Heat losses associated with direct fired water heaters are the same losses any boiler suffers. On cycle losses, idle or off cycle losses up the flue, infiltration losses, piping losses, and jacket losses. The efficiency measure for water heaters is called the energy factor or EF. Energy factor tells how efficiently the heat from the energy source is transferred to the hot water. It tells us about standby losses, the amount of heat lost per hour from the stored water compared to the heat content of the water, and cycling losses. The primary losses for oil-fired water heaters are idle losses. The energy factor for new oil direct fired water heaters range from 0.5 to 0.68. This means 50 to 68 percent of the potential energy in the fuel is converted into hot water and stays in the water heater until it's used. Water heaters are also rated in what's called the first hour rating. This is the gallons of hour gallons of hot water that can be produced by the water heater in one hour of operation. Indirect fired water heaters use the boiler water to heat the domestic water. To understand the efficiency of indirect water heating requires an understanding of the efficiency of the boiler. The secondary considerations involve heat transfer and storage. There is no government or industry-wide sanctioned way to measure the efficiency of indirect fired water heaters. The most common type of indirect water heater is the tankless coil. The reason it's the most common is it's inexpensive to install. The disadvantages are that it can draw water faster than the tankless can heat it. It has sometimes inconsistent water temperatures. And the pro biggest problem is you have to keep the whole boiler hot 24 hours a day so somebody can wash their fingertips on a hot August night. And finally, their big problem is that it can lime up quickly with even moderately hard water. Tankless coils, where a coil of copper is inserted into the boiler heat exchanger and domestic water goes through the inside of the copper coil and is heated by the boiler water surrounding it, is the most common type of indirect water heater. The reason it's the most common is it's very inexpensive to install. Okay? The disadvantages are that you can draw water faster than the tankless coil can heat it. The water can run through the coil too quickly and not be warm enough. It also causes inconsistent water temperatures depending on what the temperature of the boiler is. If the boiler is running to heat the house at the time that you're drawing hot water, the water will be a lot hotter than if it's just running to heat the domestic water. The biggest disadvantage is you have to keep the whole boiler hot 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, sending with all of those idle losses, sucking heat up the chimney so that somebody can wash their fingertips on a hot August night. And the last disadvantage of tankless coils is that they can lime up very quickly with even moderately hard water because when the water flows through the copper, the limestone or calcium is drawn out of the water and it coats the inside of the tankless coil, 
reducing efficiency, and also reducing water flow. Let's look at water heater energy conservation strategies. The first is insulate the hot water pipes. Saving how much they save will depend on the location of the tank and pipes in the building. If the tank and pipes are located in the living space, then any heat they lose helps heat the building. But in the summer, they're probably making the air conditioner work harder. Installing heat traps on the inlet and outlet of a water heater reduces the buoyancy-induced air water flow. That is, because hot water rises, it sneaks up the pipe when the water heater isn't working. Okay. These simple pipe loops reduce unintended hot water circulation for a small installation cost, with typical paybacks of less than a year. Heat traps are already built into many high-efficiency water heaters, and adding external ones is redundant. Okay. The next savings is to recommend water conditioning. Hard water is very tough on any water heating system. Hard water causes lime, that is calcium deposits, on the heat exchanger surfaces, in the lines, and in the valves. The lime will reduce the performance and can lead to insufficient hot water and wasted energy. This calcium buildup must be removed periodically. Over time, calcium will build up and it's necessary to flush the sediment out of the bottom of the water heater tank. To eliminate the need for coil cleaning, recommend the customers with hard water install water softeners. Acidic water will attack pipes and tanks. In this case, you should recommend acid neutralizers to the customer. The next is simple energy, hot water energy conservation. Obviously, low flow shower heads and low flow faucet aerators, cold water rinse cycles for washing machines, and most importantly, fixing any leaky hot water faucets can significantly reduce the amount of hot water used. Now the question is which water heater is best and the answer is it depends. For a furnace or a large hot water demand relative to the heat load, the best option is the high recovery king, the direct fired oil powered water heater. If the customer has a reasonably efficient boiler, they are better off with a storage tank indirect water heater because the only one, there's only one burner heating both the space and water. The best system of all is an integrated boiler with an indirect water heater and a storage tank system.